Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on uh, communicating through the pandemic with uh, the communications office at the city of Peoria. My name is Steve Russell. I'm the project manager of the ASU Project Cities program. Uh, we're a program of the ASU Sustainable Cities Network at ASU's Global Future Laboratory. We're pleased to have you with us today for a new uh, webinar and video series that we're just getting off the ground here. Since starting the program in 2017, we've facilitated 49 class projects with 28 different schools and programs across the university. Um, so this diversity of academic disciplines and uh, thought is important because um, as our panelists will tell you today, um, dealing with these municipal, municipal sustainability challenges is best handled through the sort of multidisciplinary approach. So by convening together today, um, I hope our students can all walk away with a better idea of the complexity of these challenges and how your various perspectives can contribute to a bigger picture effort. Um, I want to uh, thank our esteemed panelists and colleagues for joining us today. Um, and I'll quickly introduce, um, we are joined by um, the Office of Communication at the City of Peoria today. Um, the Peoria Communications Office operates a full service uh, marketing communications operation, um, really covering the full gambit of uh, public relations firms uh, operations for every city department. Um, so first up, we have um, Jennifer Stein, um, who is the director of um, the Office of Communications. Um, Jen is a NAU alum. Um, we still love her for it. And uh, she's been with the city of Peoria for almost seven years, um, current position for just over four. Um, Jen is, uh, Jen's uh, past uh, most recent experience was with the city of Glendale, where she also did uh, marketing and communication PI work um, and uh, uh, various uh, news outlets um, and other PR postings before that. We're also joined today by Christina Perez, who is a communications manager um, also NAU alum um, and uh, with a, a professional certificate in marketing from the UC Berkeley. Um, Christina uh, joined the city of uh, Peoria in 2015. Um, so math tells me she's just about four years. Did I do that math? No, five years. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, something I learned uh, new too, Christina was a former ASU adjunct faculty. So that's pretty cool. Um, numerous past postings with media outlets as well. Um, and yeah, we're just uh, so grateful to have you both with us here today. Um, we're joined from students um, in uh, several projects um, representing uh, projects dealing with communication, uh, recycling, um, sustainability planning, and more. Um, I thank you so much for joining us today, Jen and Christina. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to you to um, tell us a little bit um, about kind of what you do on a daily basis. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so we have um, a small but mighty office of communications uh, here at the city. Um, we have uh, divided the department into kind of two sections where we have a digital media special specialist area that um, is responsible for handling our social media efforts as well as programming Channel 11, which is our 24-hour, um, seven days a week government TV station. So that's kind of the first side. And then the other side of the house is more of our traditional marketing PR side, um, where Christina, when I turned over to her, can talk more about that, that oversees our graphics and our web and our public um, information area. So we work with the media daily. Um, they are there are three or four who are very interested in covering Peoria um, as their beat. So they um, have a great relationship with us and, and definitely we love sharing our stories and communicating um, messages and promoting upcoming programs, events, activities, um, campaigns. You know, there's just always something going on in the city, um, whether it's happening in the recycling side, the library, economic development, um, engineering, there's, there's just so much information to share and to push out. And so um, it's definitely an honor to be part of this department and to have the opportunity to touch every aspect of the city. Um, so with that said, Christina, I'm gonna turn it over to you because I know you really are, are the one who delves into a lot of these um, media topics daily. 
Yeah, yeah. So as a communication marketing manager, I'm sure just the title alone kind of alludes to what I do, which is a little bit of everything. Um, <laughs> I think the the biggest component that um, I think we do more of than maybe other cities don't is the media relations side of the house. Um, we do a lot of uh, proactive pitching. Um, we come up with story ideas. This is kind of where Jen's background in TV and mine and, and newspaper and magazine help. Um, because we kind of come up with what we think our local media would be interested in. And, and it's usually, you know, really good stories about, you know, we've put adaptive accessible playground equipment into our new park. And, you know, how does that help, you know, our local families and, and things like that. And so we do a lot of that development side of the house. And then uh, we nurture those relationships daily. Um, we always get questions of, you know, the newsworthy stuff as well. So um, I handle a lot of that. And then, then there's the crisis communications portion of it that, you know, Jen leads and then I kind of assist as we go along that you know, I'm sure we'll be talking about later <laughs> in this webinar. Um, but a lot of that is actually a good chunk of our day. Um, the rest of it is uh, content development, strategy, uh, a good portion of what I do is help departments come up with what is it that you need to communicate to residents and how can we do that? How can we accomplish it? So talking about timelines, budgets, creative development, you know, ad campaigns, working with them on, you know, what that can look like for them. And, and then um, I oversee a, a team of uh, graphic designers as well as uh, our web administrator. So as you can imagine, all of that needs to be working together. Um, and sometimes that's kind of like herding cats, depending on how quickly we have to turn things around. Um, and then obviously at, at all stages, we also need to engage the digital side of the house because that's a huge active um, engagement piece for us. So uh, making sure that whatever we're doing is either also adaptable for the social space or you know, maybe some story that we're working on is actually better told through video. So um, most of what I do is kind of pulling all those things together so it makes sense and that we're creating something that people will respond to or be interested in. So um, yeah, and you know, today I, I had questions about how do you report dead donkeys? So, I mean, it, it can really be anything. So um, we kind of are a little bit of a, um, we have to know a little bit about everything. So um, who do you call? Like, what, And so that's where some of this experience comes into play or I, I lean heavily on Jen and, you know, what, I have no idea what department handles that. So, you know, it, it, it's very interesting job, so. It is, and, it, and everything's urgent. Just, and I, that's why I'm yeah. like trying not to look at my phone, but I've already had like Christina um, this morning went past a, a medical building that's going through a demolition, which is a really big deal because it's been a blighted, structure for 10 years. It's created a lot of community angst. The media has been very interested. It's coming down. So it was supposed to come down next week. And Christina luckily lives over there in South Keats for the coming down. And, and everyone's like, oh, no, they're just doing prep work. And I felt bad. I was questioning Christina this morning on it. And then I've already had four urgent emergency texts and calls in the last five minutes saying it's actually completely coming down. Can you get your staff out there right now? to get drone video and shoot it and document this monumental moment. And I'm like, I'm on a panel, but okay, let me see what I can do. So there's a lot of multitasking um, where you're going to do most likely five things at one time um, and get really good at, at you know, of, of doing that, you know, um, bouncing from task to task because there are so many people who need a communication aspect or, or, or platform or something from you at any given moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a lot. And uh, Jen, let us know if he needs to buy you a few minutes to respond to. <laughs> I got no idea. Looking at the camera and texting like Al <laughs> Cool. All good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, doing that quick intro. Um, I uh, have, so we have a few um, questions um, that we prepped ahead of time for you. Um, I want to get just a couple of those out there just to kind of start the conversation and then we're going to turn it over to you all to see what kind of questions uh, you have for the communications panel. So um, with that, um, so there's, I, I love when I get this far into a meeting and realize that no one's talked about COVID. 
um, because it very rarely happens these days, right? Because there's this pretty all-consuming thing that's um, ever-present. It's affecting the way that we approach literally everything right now. Um, and uh, running a communications office, you have um, all sorts of challenges that pop up in responding to this type of crisis situation. Um, in fact, one of the classes um, that you'll be working with the most closely is looking specifically at that. So I'd like to start there. Um, and maybe if we can just start with, um, uh, I know Jen, we, we talked about a few of these the other day, but can you provide maybe uh, uh, one or two good examples of some of the um, challenges that maybe <laughs> that have come up as a result of the pandemic that maybe are really illustrate the, um, the tricky nature of this type of communication and messaging um, or that you just didn't see coming, right? Or anything that kind of surprised you. Um, so what are some of the like, big kind of standout um, examples of some of those communication challenges? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it, there's, there's, there's some significant ones. Um, I, I just have to start this by saying, Christina came to me the end of January, uh, which I almost said last year, because it feels like so long ago, but in January and February and said, I'm hearing about this thing called, well, at the time it was Corona, yeah, coronavirus, and do you think I should put a, flyer out internally um, to let people know. And I was like, maybe we should start there and, and couple it with wash your hands and do some generic messaging. And, and this was way before any of this was like blowing up, right? But it was just, I, I say that because we are constantly monitoring and paying attention to everything that's going on out there in the world because we know at some point we might have to localize it. And when we localize it, for us in Peoria, in this particular pandemic, it's hyper-localizing it to really make sure that we are providing important information, yet it is in conjunction with the state and the county and the CDC recommendations. So from the very, the very moment this happened, Christine and I said, we've got to really make sure to preference everything um, and, and position it that we're following the recommendations because we are not public health experts and we do not have a public health department. So with that said, the biggest challenge is trying to take that information from the experts, then deliver it to our residents, coupled with the ordinances that we have locally, as well as the ex executive order with the governor. So the first challenge is trying to sort through what information we need to communicate, how it can be effective. But the biggest challenge is knowing the different audiences and how they are going to react and respond to the information and how much do we engage them. And I say that because right away, once we started putting out just even basic, simple, wear a mask, wash your hands, physical distance messaging, which cannot be any more benign than that, we would get the group of people who are adamantly, for whatever reason, opposed to that information and, and would deeply criticize us to the people who are incredibly thankful and shared gratitude to those that are like, I really don't know what to do with this information. So right away, we had three different audiences or three different reactions, same audience. We know our residents, we know our business owners, we knew, we kind of put everybody in a, in a Christina, remember, we kind of had a, a, a category for everyone. So we knew priority messaging. But really, it was how do we respond to all the negative criticism to the crisis we're going, we're dealing with. So we kind of had to start there. And Christina, maybe you can talk about, you know, answering questions versus not responding to certain comments that, you know, I don't know if you agree with that kind of assessment, but what do you think? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we even realized that we had to make sure our internal audience, our employees were getting the same message, but was targeted to what they do when they interact with residents and um, realizing that it was much more complex than we thought. And we, we had to make sure it went through several layers of review and understanding, because if we put out a message and say, one department wasn't aware of it, or they had different protocols, then it would fall flat. Um, and then people would wonder, you know, what information we were putting out. So, and so we had, you know, all these buckets of people that we had to make sure we had information going to. And 
you know, our online um, social media presence was obviously where we got the most interaction. I mean, we did get phone calls and emails, but there's a lot more people that were comfortable <laughs> commenting on our social. And yeah, we had to learn very quickly the people that were expressing opinion and feeling versus the people that had legitimate questions and, and needed information. Um, and because we are a municipality and not, you know, a, a business in the private sector, we had to be careful about making sure um, the information we were sharing was educational, informative, uh, factual based, and that if they, you know, had concerns or, or wanted to offer feedback to help or to not help, <laughs> that we could direct them to the appropriate sources. Um, we also, our social media, we consider a limited public forum. So um, people are allowed to express their opinions, but there's also some level of appropriateness. Um, and so when, when people would get very angry or threatening or um, kind of spammy with, you know, always hitting us with the same thing, um, then we would try to take that conversation offline or we would start to hide some of those um, very vile comments. But for the most part, we kind of let people express their thoughts and, um, you know, tried to be consistent with our information. Uh, the hardest part about all of that is that we were noticing we were getting different types of information too. So then we had to filter, okay, what do we share? What do we not? What should we wait on? You know, that kind of stuff too. So. And, and really quick, just finding the balance because what, yeah. something we also have been criticized on is either it's too much information or not enough information, depending on what side you're on. So with Halloween, we, we, we've taken a little beating at first. You know, we didn't do enough education um, on uh, safety protocols for Halloween. So now we've, we've amped that up a little bit, but again, it's just, it's just that balance and it's, and it's tricky. Well, I think um, one wonderful thing is you, you've uh, hit my next two questions um, in your response there. So I was going to talk about how, you know, and you, you mentioned this, the pandemic evokes a high degree of emotion, no matter who you are and what your perspective is. And it is, it's exceptionally challenging to make messaging that is able to um, bring down the temperature. You mentioned some strategies like taking conversations offline. Um, giving people the space to have um, that conversation, express what they need to express. And as a public forum, you know, you have, you have some tricky balancing act to pull there. Um, can, I guess one follow-up question I have for that is, um, no, actually I'd like to keep us moving. Never mind, I'm not gonna go there. Uh, <laughs> because you, you definitely, you, you talked a lot about that. But another challenge I think too, is that there is a lot of misinformation out there about the pandemic, right? That's been kind of characteristic from day one. Um, that comes from a lot of sources, um, but that's got to be, I mean, you're, you're dealing with life and death and people's safety and security. Um, and at the same time, you're fighting this whole misinformation ecosystem. So how do you manage that? How do you balance that? Um, it's, it's hard. I mean, that's why we've been really consistent with following, I would say, again, the state and county's information um, and finding a resource and using the data and, and metrics that um, our health community relies on, we, we've been using. I think as long as we're consistent in what metrics and what information that we're sharing, we've even got to point, Christina can probably elaborate on this too, is where we didn't even want to create the original post or create the original story and we just wanted to share what already existed so that way we weren't completely responsible in the event that maybe there was um, a change of information that you know it, it wasn't something we created initially. Christina is that kind of how you feel when, when you're determining information sharing? Yeah definitely um, you know I think uh, once we realized that was starting to happen we found out that our local um, public relations uh, people were starting to gather and meet regularly. So I, I got in on as many of those. So it was at the county level and the state level. And I think that helped because we were able to um, all sort of agree on what types of information made the most sense for cities to share. And then we realized that we also didn't have to recreate the wheel 
that there was a lot of content being created for us. So if we wanted to, we could personalize it or localize it, but at least the source of the information was coming from the same place. And then also sharing with our leadership that that was our approach. <laughs> so that regardless of personal opinions or personal stances or whatever on um, you know what was happening, we were all pulling information and gathering things and making plans based off of the same thing. So that helps. Can I uh, reiterate, because I've been taking notes and I'm gonna um, post my notes. So can I reiterate what you've said, like your four points and then you can um, bring to my attention anything that I've missed? Absolutely. So, um, one of the issues is what to communicate and um, factors that are pertinent include what is it, um, what to communicate for cities, like what does it make sense for cities to communicate? And, and then um, secondarily, how to be effective for distinct audiences. And we've already talked about the challenges of having very polarized audiences with very different views about masking. And actually I have a idea about that problem. And then the issue of, um, of uh, multiple stakeholders because you're communicating uh, to internal stakeholders who also have to communicate to external stakeholders. And um, of course, that's a challenge. ASU is experiencing that challenge also. Um, and then the, um, the final uh, major point was this uh, issue of um, information and affect and the uh, coding of it and um, ha finding the balance between um, having uh, the potential for emotional content for amplification of risk. Um, can, I, can I interrupt for a second? Because yeah. I, I totally know what you mean by affect, but you know, for everyone else who's on the line who probably doesn't, can you explain what you mean by that? Well, <clears throat> So um, there is a, um, a tendency um, to impose um, attributions uh, to the um, primary uh, most visible indicators of the management of the crisis like mask to uh, attach emotional connotations, like for example, the idea that masks are di face diapers or the idea that masks are muzzles. These are um, emotional connotations that are part of narratives that question uh, the legitimacy of the response and the severity of the hazard. But when people are in this, um, these sorts of emotional discourses, then actual evaluation, even though they're capable of reasonably evaluating, actually evaluating information in a balanced and neutral way is impossible, even though the people are ordinarily capable of it, but because of the emotional coding. That's what I mean by affect in this context. Yeah. And, and I'd like to pick up on that um, and, mm -hmm. and uh, tie it back to something that Jen and Christina were talking about. Um, and this is kind of a, you know, kind of what makes Peoria Peoria kind of question, right? So who, who are um, your target audiences? You mentioned earlier the tool of, of, uh, of uh, segmenting out um, kind of who they are and how you're, um, how you're messaging to them. So what, what can, uh, what are you able to tell us kind of about that? Um, so our, our, you know, first and foremost, residents, that's, uh, you know, our, our, our biggest, you know, target audience and, and definitely top of mind when we are conveying key messaging. Um, then, of course, other stakeholder groups include our business community and business owners, visitors, which also are, are tourists, visitors. Um, and then, of course, our employee base, we have almost 1,500 employees, which also includes our mayor and council, which comprises of important stakeholders. Um, and then, who am I missing? Am I missing any other target audiences? The media, 
Yeah, that's all I was going to say. I mean, and a lot of times we end up having to segment those audiences too, depending on what. So like our business community can be the the hyper local business owner versus the, you know, big box chain that's in our community. So sometimes we do that depending on what we're, you know, trying to accomplish, but. And then geographically, I, I mean, I'll just be real honest. I don't, I, I don't, I hate to say this, but there's different in our residents of different groups and different age sections that collect information differently. Maybe uh, some sectors aren't as digital savvy. So we need to, we have to consider their needs and how to communicate um, more traditionally. There's, there's the younger groups, there's the um, different groups in our city, just geographically that maybe don't have access to online as easily, or they, um, you know, when we did this consumer, we we're talking earlier about a consumer research survey for finding or identifying needs during the pandemic. In our southern port of Peoria, they did not get very many responses. In the northern side, we got more. So we had to figure out how to segment and go into next door and find different ways to reach the audience. So not only do we have to know the audience, we have to understand the audience and figure out what, what uh, means of communication that they rely on their source and their, reason, their news essentially and then of course couple that with when when do we share information that's probably one of the biggest challenges from Christine and I's perspective is once we have a piece of information we need to share when do we release it and are, do we do it in conjunction with another entity do we follow up do we, you know the, the, the timing is everything too it's, especially with the pandemic and the high emotion and sensitivities around it is, you know, when, and when do you not say certain things? There's, there's that too to consider. There's, there's a lot more, there's a lot of moving parts before we release information. I just dropped a link into the chat for everyone who's on the line um, with the uh, Peoria social media channels. How many social media channels do you manage? <laughs> um, I think we're about 38 uh, last I checked. So um, yeah, and each of these, uh, depending on what's going on, can work all as one or separately and, and kind of segment our audiences. So, but it can be a bit much at times. <laughs> yeah, and, um, you know, I think uh, this came up on our call, on our last call, social media has been particularly important with uh, messaging around COVID, uh, right? So um, one of the... Um, questions I have, and this is going to kind of pick up on a few different things. Um, so we were talking on one of our last calls about the ways that you can kind of think outside of the box um, to message this, right? Um, I think, uh, Jen, the example that we were talking about was a was an interactive hot scotch game in the park, um, teaching kids about um, tasks like, like hand washing and um, demonstrating what a six feet difference uh, distance might look like. Um, so you know we're we're definitely we're definitely thinking outside the box here um, because traditional outreach channels have all sorts of challenges to them. Um, we don't know how to reach people in these times, and you you brought up kind of the um, the uh, difference in response rates between different communities. Um, you know, in this uh, polarized time where people are getting kind of more sorry that was loud more and more bifurcated. Um, you know, how, how the heck <laughs> do you, do you manage that kind of um, outreach network? I mean, it's Good definitely question. a challenge, you know, there's, yeah, and then why don't we couple that with there's a little election next week, you know, just a little one. Um, and there's so much noise, right? There's so much like coverage and, and related to the election and COVID and it's just how do we also break through that noise and how do how does our messaging get across not only effectively but credibly you know we, we, we really want people to trust the information from the city of Peoria it is in, it is incredibly important to me and Christina that the information we share is accurate it's factual it's it's it's, it's designed to help inform empower you I mean it, it inspire you I mean it th these are very important you know pieces of, of of information we want people to take seriously and how do we get them to take it seriously um and so there is a need to become more creative and forward thinking 
and 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 how do we do that do a renovation? You know, when the executive order occurred when restaurants were asked to close um, and it was only a takeout model, you know, a couple of things. The city of Seward immediately provided banners and support and help, you know, support local, do your do the takeout, do the you know delivery serve, take advantage of delivery services. But then we even took it one step further and we were putting city information into the takeout bags. We asked the restaurants like, hey, can you share census or we have some, you know, important um, pandemic tips, you know, just trying to find ways that, that we can touch the community and, and um, you know, we, we welcome thoughts and that's why we love our partnership with ASU through Project Cities because the students have incredible creative thoughts that will help us during this time and then the feedback is imperative because I can say, and with, along with everyone else, that no one has gone through this before. And I have dealt with lots of crisis communication and issues management. I, I thought I was a pro, but I take that back. So it's all new to us. <laughs> yeah, and we also are working on, you know, thin budgets and time frames, just like every other organization. And so how do you be creative and get engagement without spending a fortune mm -hmm. you know so i think that's a, a problem that most businesses face and most municipalities face too so mm -hmm. yeah you hear that students uh, let's think outside the box this semester um <laughs> and, and that's good thinking too I, I i like that idea of reaching out to the to the restaurants you know we're all doing takeout um trying to find kind of the, the things that uh, can, that COVID has changed consumer behavior and how can we target them there um, I want to ask my last question and then I'll turn it over to, um, to, uh, actually after I ask this question, Maya, I'd love if you could recap for us again, um, and then we'll turn it over to, um, the students for any questions that they may have. Um, so my last question for you here is, um, a lot of the students who will be turning, tuning into this, um, are, uh, aspiring, uh, communications professionals. Um, they are looking for work either in the academic field um, or in public relations, um, the type of work that you're doing here. Um, so um, as folks who've, who've been around uh, uh, doing this type of work for a while, what kind of advice um, would you give to any of our students as they, uh, they build their careers? I love this question. I love it because it, just, it, it brings me joy to, to be able to help in any way. But I'll just start out with that because I know um, we've all been there, right? When you're about to graduate and you want to, you know, enter into this in incredible industry and how do you get started and, and what should you do? And um, first of all, it's the most rewarding field. I'm so happy um, when students, you know, tell me they're, they want to pursue PR because it's, it's and Christina and I talk about this all the time. It's, it's like mission critical when you think about one, some of the most successful companies in this world. It's really their marketing and PR people that I think are behind the scenes helping drive that success. And so um, I, I love talking and sharing my experience. I know Christina's done that. So we are always available for informational interviews. I think you should take advantage of meeting with as many industry experts as possible to kind of get a feel and a perspective and um, just ideas. Internships are, are, are key. We, we've had a number of interns come through. Um, our office and I always um, provide references and, and try to help find them opportunities to continue to pursue their career and, and continue um, learning. So, you know, there's just there's just get involved in public relations society of America PRSA. I know that's more of a virtual platform right now. I was um, back in the day president of the student chapter PRSSA and then I became a member of PRSA and I was with IABC, which is the International Association of Business Communicators. So really um, take advantage of the professional associations because they have um, a number of not only networking opportunities, but uh, professional development and, and again, you know, classes and, and reference resources there. But just get yourself in front of as many people as you can that are in the industry because we, we want to help. We want to pay it forward. We want we want to see um, you guys thrive and, and feel confident when you get out there. Yeah, um, I would say first have some patience. Um, I'm sure you're hearing that from other people and you're like rolling your eyes like, oh, you know, I just want to get started. 
Um, but the reason why I say that is I took an unconventional approach to, to end up here. And I, I kind of encourage that because um, I started out as a journalist. And if, if the people I worked with now knew I was in PR, I would be like, oh my God, you crossed the dark side. And why did you do that? And <laughs> um, but, you know, I was graduating during the recession, you know, a decade ago. And that was a really tough time to be in any job, let alone a journalist. And the world has changed dramatically, especially just this year. I mean, I, that's why I think, um, you know, finding your path is, is going to take some time and it's okay because you're going to learn along the way, which stuff is just not on the list anymore, right. That you're just not interested in, but also each piece that I, you know, from each job I took with me. So I consider myself a pretty well-rounded communications professional now because of that. So you know, I've worked on the media side, I've done nonprofit, I've done, you know, public se sector, private sector, agency work, a little bit of everything. And, you know, what I learned along the way was I wanted to do something that um, was meaningful and had an impact on daily lives. And I wasn't selling toothpaste or, you know, <laughs> trying to answer to an editor who, you know, was answering to boss that just wanted to, you know, sell ads. So in the end, I came to a spot where I feel like all of that was, you know, something I could apply and, you know, bring something to the table here that really works and still works. So, you know, I, I think sometimes we get a little down on ourselves because we didn't end up that, in that big PR gig or journalism gig that we wanted right out of uh, college. But I think it, it leads you to something bigger and greater later. So I think that's where the, the patience comes into play <laughs> and it'll all work out i swear <laughs> so. yes thank you both for that uh and and uh, uh i i definitely echo uh, both of your comments um jen's point to uh getting to know professionals um students that is such a good idea just just scheduling a phone call don't make it a waste of anyone's time right you know have some meaningful questions and, and ask for some advice on your career but um you know i uh uh used to try and reach out to you know at least one person um every week just uh just an email hey i think you're doing some cool work over here um can i pick your brain um it's definitely worth the time invested um, and to Christina's point, uh, as a fellow graduate into the recession, I feel your pain. Um, I ended up doing door-to-door -door fundraising and canvassing uh, after college, <laughs> um, which is certainly not where I wanted to be, right? But you get incredible skills by stepping outside of your industry um, and taking the, the long path, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, I want to, um, at this point, uh, turn it over to uh, Maya. Can I uh, put you on the spot? I thought your last recap was really helpful. Um, what, what are you taking away from this? Okay, so, so this is information that I'm gonna um, add to what I've already shared with students, um, sort of a, an objective of developing legitimate, effective, accurate um, COVID-19 information. I'm, I've been typing, so it's not actually <laughs> grammatical yet. Um, designed to not only inform in a timely manner, but also to inspire um, stakeholders. And it raises important questions about what information uh, should Peoria communicate, um, what to communicate and when and by what channels for which audiences and students will need to, and they're doing this in their first assignment, consider the, you know, what laws and policies shape what can be said about COVID and are in fact the legitimate sources of information about COVID. Uh, social cultural considerations, what cultural beliefs and social institutions have relevance for COVID messaging uh, by Peoria, like the social institution of Halloween, which I'm sure has created all kinds of additional work on your part to figure out how to manage that from a communication perspective. And then uh, media access issues, what are the best means of communicating for distinct targeted audiences? Um, to audience analysis, students always have to do that. They're going to have to do that with each of these assignments. And how to adapt <clears throat> the messages 
for each of these different audiences, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, within each of these distinct audience categories, we can further segment them. So for example, residents are not a homogeneous category. Residents can and probably do have very polarized views that are relevant to our objective. Uh, businesses, visitors, city employees, who themselves become representatives of city messaging by echoing the messages that they have received. And then also how to respond to or not, or manage or address um, the uh, escalation of um, affect um, about um, the COVID um, policy responses over which our communicators really don't have a lot of control anyway, since most of those decisions are made at the level of the county or the state. But in, in this context, fraught context of disinformation campaigns, how do they communicate messages smartly so that it doesn't get coded as being um, not legitimate or uh, having a hidden agenda? So that's what I have uh, synopsized. And now I will stop share. Awesome. Thanks, Maya. Well, and we have about 15 okay, minutes left. I, was gonna say, I think that's really great what you just shared. I think that's spot on, so thank you. Great, thank you. And and we have uh, about 15 minutes left. I'd like to, we have some more questions that we can uh, fire off at you. And, um, but I'd like to check in with our students first. Um, I know Janelle uh, and Kayla have been uh, listening and uh, I'll invite uh, either or both of you, uh, whoever hits it first, if you have any questions, go ahead and um, unmute uh, and turn on your video and uh, go ahead and address your question. I had um, just a few questions come to mind as we've been um, talking and everything. Um, one that's kind of pressing on my mind is uh, you had talked about adjusting or filtering the message from the expert and translating that to your audiences. Is there a specific um, way that you do that? Do you do a certain amount of steps every time you have to take information from an expert and then, um, you know, translate it to your audiences or is it different kind of each time depending on the information you have to share? Can I take a stab at that? Yeah. Well, one that purposes. Yeah, I mean, typically, you know, I first have to really take it in and understand it myself, um, depending on how complex the information is. Um, the first step is if it is complex, like it's scientific or, or you know, technically challenging for the average citizen, then I, I kind of simplify as much as possible, um, break things down uh, so that you're not, you know, putting out a novel for people to try to consume and understand. Um, and then um, if the information is actually already done in that manner, then we localize. So um, sometimes that's just checking in with our leadership to make sure it already aligns with something that's you know, going on um, or even legal. Sometimes there's something that, you know, legal considerations, but uh, typically we just want to apply it to residents. So if say the CDC puts something out about, um, you know, COVID in winter, well, <laughs> I don't really have a winter here to really worry about. So, you know, <laughs> Maybe we'll just say, as a reminder, this, these are steps you can take to protect yourself and, and, and take out the winter information altogether. So it, it does depend, but mostly um, it starts with our understanding and then making sure that um, it's almost bite-sized information that our residents can take in because regardless of their intellect level, they're also not um, sitting down in front of the computer to read things for an hour. You know, they're, they're perusing very quickly, maybe one or two seconds at times to look at our information. So we want to make sure that they're able to, you know, capture a few couple things maybe um, before they move on to something else. So. That's a good point, you know, is simplifying the information, knowing that people are just quickly glancing and, and not spending a lot of time. So if we can, if we can modify, if we can use a, you know, an image, like we have a mascot called Prickly Pete. So, you know, I remember we were trying to be creative, put a mask on for a TV, you know. Um, we put a mask on that little piggy Christina and the Halloween pumpkin mm -hmm. every day, like just trying to come up with. But the other thing to keep in mind when we are sharing information and we're modifying and we're simplifying and we're doing all these things to keep 
keep um, information flowing is when we talked about emotion the other um, moment we're talking about how this is highly emotional. I think Stephen and both Christina referenced that. We also have to take the emotion out because that's hard. I'm going to tell you right now during the pandemic because I am a huge fan of, of what the doctors and the scientists are saying. So I, I'm, if you say wear a mask, I, I, I'll wear a mask. You tell me to wrap myself in bubble wrap, okay. Whatever it means to keep you know the community safe and my family safe. But I got to be careful because that's that's my that's my personal feeling. So we have to be really careful when we are taking that information or sorting through it that we learn that we maintain objective. Mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question. Great, thank you for that, um, uh, Kayla. Uh, did you have any questions for our panelists? Yeah, um, I guess I was kind of wondering, the holiday season is coming up, um, so I just was wondering if you guys had anything that you were doing in the influx of travel and just groups getting together in general during that. And that's a good question. You know, I think it's really important that we continue to have a steady reminder of, of the safety protocols that are recommended and to um, our, our, our philosophy, right, Christine, I'm going to try to say this right, is we like to educate first. Mm -hmm. Actually, educate always. <laughs> I mean, I just get educate and then maybe enforce, but I don't even, I mean, really education is extremely important. And in order to, to continue that that philosophy we, we want to through the winter time especially as the flu and other illnesses collide with covid um keep that going because christina don't you think people have covid fatigue and are are, are, are pretty much ignoring our stuff and before i, I turn it over our website and, and christina correct me but the website the covid website when we launched it the peoria one had i don't know like let's say ten thousand hits originally and now it's down to like what like 200 mm -hmm. yep yeah, and people, I think, um, whether they believe in what's going on or not, or, or have any particular feelings about it, um, are just, they just don't want to hear the word COVID, they don't want to see the word COVID, they don't want to have anything to do with it anymore. And so we have to find a way to still gently include that information, especially during the holidays, because the attention is going to be turned to family gatherings and, you know, all the traditions related to the holidays. And so how do you do that without um, making it worse, you know, and, and contributing to the fatigue? Um, and I think it's being gentle and consistent. <laughs> and also, what are we going to do with our own events? Like, how are we handling yeah. stuff? You know, how is ASU handling stuff? Because whatever we do, it, there's more eyes on the public sector than the private sector. You know, they're, they're going to look at us. If we open up an event on city property with thousands of people, Look at the optics. We've got to always consider the optics too when we communicate, and and that's tough too. So as we get into the winter, and and we're also seeing in other parts of the country some really serious issues, um, and not trying to you know separate us out, but make sure to get those facts and, and really pay attention to how do you um, respond to the metrics we're receiving. I think that was another line I wrote in my last meeting. Someone had another good line related to this, but now I can't find it. Shoot. Trends, not spikes. Oh, that was it. Someone was saying, you know, we need to respond to the trend, not the spike, when we when we start to communicate. And I was like, okay, I, I I get that. Although trends sometimes take a little bit longer than a spike, so there there we go again. How do we balance what I'm being told here and the reality of the situation? Good question. Thank you. We're seeing a lot of <clears throat> fatigue. I mean, we're seeing that too. And, and it's not just fatigue with COVID. It's like fatigue with life sort of thing. And, and what is happening is that it's creating cognitive dissonance. And so people are, I see it happening they, they think that the vaccine is going to come out and everything is going to go back to normal, even though Fauci and a number of other public health authorities are trying to temper expectations. And I wouldn't even go there, but I think it's 
That's why this period is being represented as the most risky in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. There's no uh, therapeutics. Nothing. And yet people are, are hoping so much that a solution is around the corner and are unable to come to grip with the continuation. One thing that um, I was wondering, I, I found an image of the role of mass based in empirical research in reducing the total particles in the air. And the thing about masks is, the, I've been following the criticism of masks really carefully. And if you just look at masks in terms of whether they're going to protect you personally, masks have limited utility. But the point of mask is to bring down the overall level of viral load. So if everybody's wearing masks, the amount of virus that's in aerosols in the air is significantly lower. So even if you do get it, you're not going to get as sick because viral load plays such a big role. Exactly. And I'm wondering if communications, I was thinking about um, the article that I found that had that nice little diagram. I was thinking about uh, emailing them and seeing if it was copyrighted and if it was copyrighted, whether they could allow for its use or recommend it, similar representations. Because a good like cartoon representation, even adapted for like, you know, kids and Halloween. Definitely. Something fun. Yeah, you could have like the kids with the Halloween masks and, and the kids without. And in the without picture, there's these terrible, scary, germy goblins, lots and lots of them in the air. And then with the mask, there's like a tenth the scary germy goblins in the air. Yes. To get the concept that, because that's why the anti-maskers are so compelling because intuitively, you know that a mask is not gonna stop a tiny virus, but if you're just looking at absolute viral load, somehow iconically to represent things that are conceptually reframing in ways that are cute and accessible. Yeah, well, and you're right. It is totally, I agree. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that we have come to understand too is also our, our leadership's tolerance for, for this kind of stuff too, because, you know, I think that they're responding to a variety of opinions, information, all sorts of stuff. And other times where they're like, well, just follow what the state's doing. And, you know, even the state has had a lot of criticism for the information that they shared and that they didn't share. And, you know, how transparent have they been this whole time? And while it puts us in a safer zone to rely on those public health departments, that also sets us up for criticisms. And then, you know, the residents who reach out to the mayor end up kind of getting more attention because it's our local residents who are upset and we need to fix it. So then we end up in this weird in-between zone of, uh, okay, so today people are okay with the messaging and maybe not tomorrow. And yeah, it's, it's a fine balance. <laughs> yeah. Sure is. Well, um, folks, we've, we have uh, just hit time. Um, so uh, I would like to give you an opportunity to do some final thoughts before we, uh, before we close this out. Um, but I'll just first say thank you so much to um, Christina Perez and Jennifer Stein um, with the Peoria um, Office of Communication. Really appreciate your time today um, on behalf of ASU and our students and uh, faculty. Thank you so much. Um, and I guess I would uh, invite you if you'd like to make any closing uh, remarks um, before we before we close out. And Maya, you're welcome to chime in briefly as well. I just want to say thank you again for the opportunity to, to take time and, and have this important conversation. Um, again, it's, it's, it's an honor. It's an honor to participate in something like this. And it's, and it's such a wonderful partnership that we're thankful for. And I just want to tell the students, Kayla, Janelle, thank you so much. 
Um, and those who may watch the recording after, please feel free to reach out to me. I, I'm really genuine when I say that. Like I, I am, I'm, I'm always here to help and help point in the right direction or, or give you any guidance that, that you might need. So please don't, Stephen knows where to find me. <laughs> um, Maya knows where to find me. Just, just ask and, and, and they'll connect you with me. Yeah, I also just dropped into the chat um, the, uh, con the contact info page on your website. So. Yeah, and I, I echo everything Jen said. Um, for those of you that heard earlier, I um, did some teaching at the Walter Cronkite School for a little over a year. And if my life wasn't so crazy at that time, I think I'd still be teaching. I loved it so much. And the biggest part of it, whether or not, you know, all the students loved every assignment I gave them or not, <laughs> was the collaboration, the interaction, the the questions that, I mean, that stuff is so exciting to me. And I, you know, I learned so much from that experience too. So I love it when we get interns or people, you know, just even think of me to talk to, you know, sometimes I still think I'm the student that just graduated myself. So I, I love being able to have that interaction and, you know, there's things along the way that, you know, even if you're just curious about what we do, it's really worth it to just ask. I know we all get shy sometimes, but um, I wish I had done that earlier on. And um, so I encourage anybody to do that or reach out on social or something that's more comfortable for you. That's fine. But um, the one thing that I think we do really well here is that if you're an intern or you just want to come and shadow, I mean, we uh, we'll let you see whatever you want to see. So <laughs> you just, just let us know. So. Well, thank you. Um, thank you everyone so much for, uh, for tuning in. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, students. Thank you to my team, Anne and Lindsay. And of course, thank you, Jen and Christina. Um, and thanks for making our, uh, our first webinar. Uh, you know, <laughs> it happened. <laughs> I, think it was pretty, I think it was pretty great. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks so much, um, students. As you may have seen, we have another webinar coming up in about 10 minutes here with the town of Clarkdale around historic preservation. Um, check your emails if you want to tune into that one. It's definitely uh, a different topic, but um, very interesting content. And uh, anyone who's interested in kind of community development work, it would be valuable to, to learn a bit about. Um, so uh, I guess with that, thank you everyone so much for tuning in. Pleasure having you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. <laughs>